I'm Mike Douglas, and I'll be speaking about numerical Calabia metrics from holomorphic networks, work with Subramania and Lakshmi Narasimhan and EDG. So the work we do is motivated by superstring theory and algebraic geometry. I won't be speaking about those aspects in this talk, and I've given here a link to a talk where I focus more on that. The main purpose of this talk will be to introduce Kähler geometry, uh, describe our uh, methods and, and embedding methods specific to complex geometry. So Riemannian geometry, geometry of uh, metrics on manifolds has many applications in uh, machine learning and elsewhere. And if you're interested, if you use Riemannian geometry in your work, you should be interested in Kähler geometry because it's a special case which is much simpler. For example, a metric is determined by a single function on the manifold, but still general enough to exhibit the most important properties of general Riemannian geometry, such as non-constant uh, curvature. In addition, there are natural embeddings, somewhat like uh, Laplacian eigenmaps, but uh, far simpler. So many powerful mathematical tools for working with Kähler manifolds. Okay, so I'm gonna assume you know the basic definitions of Riemannian geometry, that manifolds are defined using coordinate patches and in each patch a map to a region in d real dimensional space that defines coordinates. Once we have these definitions, we can define functions, vector fields, differential forms and tensors, and then the uh, Riemannian metric, the uh, bottom right definition in terms of a, a symmetric to enter to an next tensor gij. So the formal definition of a complex manifold is essentially the same. We, instead of defining real coordinates as uh, functions into Rn, we talk about function from a coordinate patch to n dimensional complex space Cn described by n explicit uh, complex coordinates. And uh, from some point of view, this is the same as a two n dimensional real manifold. We could split the complex coordinates into pairs of real and imaginary parts, giving two functions for each, or we could group real coordinates into complex. But if we rely on the complex definitions of these z's, then we have a complex manifold. And the basic uh, property that we would use is that the coordinate overlaps, the uh, transformations between coordinate systems should be holomorphic functions. So a coordinate W should be a function of the holomorphic Zs and not the complex conjugate Z bars. So if we can define our manifold that way, then we have an additional geometric structure called complex structure. In the case of a single dimension, this is actually equivalent to what may be familiar conformal structure. In, in higher dimensions, it's much studied in mathematics, but you know, essentially a new structure. Another uh, aspect we want of our definition is that the length of a tangent vector should be a non-negative real number. This will be true if the metric is Hermitian, meaning that it has these uh, only these mixed Z, Z bar components and that those, the, the matrix restricted to those components is transpose equals its complex conjugate. So that's the Hermitian condition. And here's an example of the uh, Riemann sphere the uh, complex plane with a point added at infinity and the uh, round metric written in real coordinates and then in the uh, corresponding complex coordinates. Okay, so uh, an issue in defining metrics is that uh, one usually wants two metrics to be counted as equivalent if they are related by changing coordinates. And this is actually what makes numerical relativity and the discrete ge Riemannian geometry complicated. And, this is actually simpler in complex geometry because this permit homomorphic condition on the uh, coordinate redefinitions. So let me now tell you what a Kähler metric is. We have this uh, two index metric tensor and the condition is that we can get it as the uh, double mixed derivative of a, a single real function K. And on the real Riemann sphere, you can check that uh, two log of R squared plus ZZ bar serves as a Kähler potential. Its double derivative is the metric I described. So why this definition? And uh, the answer is that uh, to get a uh, manifold with uh, 
the colonomy that you might think would be appropriate for a complex manifold, you need to make this restriction. So what's what's holonomy? So there's this idea of a metric compatible connection and parallel transport. And if you carry a vector around a closed path of the manifold, you can come back to a vector of the same length, but related by some orthogonal rotation. So here in two dimensions, just an angle alpha, more generally the uh, d-dimensional group SOD. And uh, that's general. Now, the definition of permission metric that we gave before, you might think that uh, it's more natural to be restricted to unitary rotations because those are the ones that restrict that, that uh, preserve the hermeticity condition. But it turns out that you need this Kähler condition for that to be the case. More, more generally, the holonomy will sit in SO2 lab. So these, these Kähler manifolds are the nicest complex manifolds for which the Hermitian condition is compatible with parallel transport. So the basic example, which uh, we'll use to define others, is complex projective space, which you can define as an equivalence relation, equivalence classes of points in C n plus one. So two vectors in C plus n plus one are considered to represent the same point if they are related by a common multiplication by a complex number lambda, a non-zero number, or in general, a holomorphic a function on a patch. And one can relate this to the definition in terms of patches by setting individual coordinates to one. And then there's a generalization of the Riemann sphere metric called the Fubini Studi metric, where I take my Kähler potential that I defined before and extend it to be the sum of the squares of all of these coordinates. And uh, this, if you look at it, illustrates this point that the Kähler potential is a local function, which can be different on different patches. But the metric, of course, has to agree across patches. OK, so then many complex manifolds can be defined as sub-manifolds of projective space. And uh, we will look at a hypersurface. So hypersurface is a zero set of a single equation. In, in real geometry, the uh, sphere would be a simple example. and. Uh, in our case, we're going to look at complex hypersurfaces. And the simplest example would be the Fermat hypersurface in CP2. So this uh, equation into three variables where we've raised into a common degree n. And uh, these one condition and two complex dimensions are one complex dimensional, so they're Riemann surfaces. And you can compute the genus in terms of the degree. And if the degree is 30, a cubic surface, this is genus 1, or what's called the elliptic curve. And then here I've illustrated from uh, the ICERM Illustrating Mathematics Project, the topological deformation that takes a cubic curve with its inflection points deformed into the uh, more familiar donut picture of a torus. OK, now among the Riemann surfaces, the torus is special because it emits a flat metric. The others uh, do not. And one can find the topological proof of that. And then that statement generalizes to higher dimensions in a subtle way that, uh, in particular, if we take the uh, hypersurfaces, there's a special degree which emits a Ricci flat metric, which I'll define shortly. And uh, for <clears throat> one complex dimension, that was a torus. For two complex dimensions, so a surface in CP3, a hypersurface in CP3, it's a quartic equation, and we get what's called a, a K3 surface. In a hypersurface in four complex dimensions gives us the uh, Fermat quintic Calabi-Yau threefold. So the degree five case is the special one. And then these Calabi-Yau manifolds in general are the ones that emit Ricci flat metrics. And then once we get to uh, three complex dimensions, there are many topologically distinct possibilities, but, but there are explicit representations for a lot of them. OK, so now this simplicity of Kähler geometry can be illustrated by writing the formula for the uh, Ricci tensor. Now, here's the general formula in Riemannian geometry, rather complicated. But in Kähler geometry, it simplifies to this nice uh, take the metric tensor, take its determinant to get the volume form, take the log, and then the mixed double derivative. And uh, so that's Ricci flatness, setting that to zero. And that turns out to be the case of Einstein's equation, which comes from string theory, where we say that there's no additional matter, just empty space. So this is a very you know, you know, important equation, both in relativity and in string theory. And here's the Ricci flatness equation in terms of that single function k. And you see it's a single elliptic PDE. It's a bit, it's, 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 it's 
more complicated than say you know, a, a, a constant coefficient PD. In fact, it's what equation of what's called non-gen pyrotype, where the uh, highest order determined derivatives has this determinantal form. But those equations also have many special properties, and so they're analytically relatively tractable. So, and and and, and, the, and the problem at hand, a compact Kähler manifold that admits top and topological grounds of Ritchie flat metric, uh, Yao proved in 1978 that in fact, given the appropriate finite data about the size of a manifold, there's a unique Ritchie flat metric. And this is the most intricate solution known to exist to Einstein's equations. And it's, so far as anybody knows, does not admit any explicit closed form solution. So to work with it, we need numerical methods. Okay, so, so the most successful numerical method was uh, introduced by uh, Simon Donaldson in a 2005 work. And you embed the manifold into a higher dimensional in this case, a uh, complex uh, projective space. And uh, you look at a family of simple metrics, Fubini's 2D metrics on that space, restrict them, and then look for the best approximation to a Ritchie flat metric in that space. And so here's a slight generalization of Fubini's 2D where I've introduced a metric age. On the complex projective space, I could define that away by a coordinate transformation, but on the hypersurface, this gives me for the for Mount Quintic a 25 real parameter family of metrics in which I can optimize. So that's a good start, but we would like families with an arbitrarily large number of parameters and arbitrary like good approximating power. And to get that, we take a sequence of embeddings called the Kodaira embeddings. And uh, one can be very concrete in this case at a hypersurface that we take as the coordinates of the higher dimensional projective space, the degree K monomials in the original coordinates for some fixed K. So we can choose K. Equivalently, we get a family of Kähler potentials where we take uh, K order polynomials in Z times K order polynomials in Z bar, and then take the general linear combination of those. So, the number of parameters of these metrics as entirely goes as k to the real dimension of the manifold. And as k goes to infinity, these metrics become dense in L2. So this gives us a nice approximating class of metrics. Okay. And then this strategy of embedding, of course, has, 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 has many variations and many applications in mathematics and machine learning. And I could compare it to the uh, Laplacian eigenmaps in particular, embedding graphs by eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. And this was originally you know, introduced as a way to study manifolds as well. And uh, both are geometric embeddings, but the Laplacian eigenmap requires specifying a metric and then finding eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. This geometric embedding only depended on the uh, complex structure of the manifold. And we could in fact explicitly write the uh, functions that embed the manifold. So in those ways, it's much simpler, but it's just as geometric as determined by this relatively small amount of data, complex structure, a discrete choice, which was K before and here holomorphic line bundle. So the, 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 this is a, a powerful and general technique, which I you know, encourage people to look into for further applications. Okay, so what were our results? We've implemented a, a TensorFlow Keras package for doing these types of calculations using the embedding method and representing the point manifold in terms of point sample from the manifold. And then one can show, see easily, from, you, know, you can look at our paper, the Ritchie flatness condition turns into essentially a problem of function interpolation or supervised uh, learning. So we could really just use Keras almost as it is with just a couple of extra layers implemented. So what was the really new point of our work? It was to introduce neural networks that produce uh, subsets of the general metric ansatz with uh, many fewer and a controllable number of parameters. And the most successful one was what we call the bihomogeneous network, where the inputs are the uh, real and imaginary parts of combinations of Z and Z bar. We then feed those through alternating linear transformation and activation function, which is just squaring the element. And then the output of such a network is again, a homogeneous polynomial of potentially very high degree exponential two to the depth of the network minus one, but with uh, many, many fewer parameters than K to the dimension, a controllable number depth times of width squared. Then we studied the uh, Quintic manifolds and their Ritchie flat metrics in, in, in some depth and looked at the, not just the dependence on hyperparameters, but the uh, symmetry group of the manifold, the shortest length scale of the manifolds. We 
don't just look at Fermat, but we look at a wide variety of defining equations. And the result of most interest for this audience is probably to consider this as a special case of the question, when you numerically solve a PDE, is it the case that a neural network approximation can represent the solution using fewer parameters? And uh, we have very detailed results which show that yes, sometimes that's the case, metric has symmetry, metric does not have short scales, but if you conversely have no symmetry and short distance scales, you can require as many parameters as the general Kubitis 2D metric. The network does not seem to save parameters. And this is an example of the numerical data justifying that claim. So without going into detail, the y-axis is log error. The x-axis is a proxy for the shortest distance scale. The pink points on the bottom are the best you could do with a degree eight polynomial on the Kubitis 2D metrics. The, uh, Green points are a neural network, which is also degree eight with roughly the same number of parameters. The purple points is a degree eight network with a factor of 20 fewer parameters. And you can see that for metric without a short distance scale on the left, it does just as well, but with the short distance scale on the right, it does not, it does measurably worse. So that illustrates our results. Okay, uh, thank you for your attention and uh, we'll stop there.